look at all the stars here, live from Nerdville. Um, Charlie, thank you for doing this. Um, like, like I said uh, in the intro, it, I've been a fan for 20 years. I mean, like, like your first record came out, I think, 20, 2003 as a band. 2001, two. two. That, yeah. that one was at the, a trunk of the car release, so you probably weren't anywhere near the trunk of our car. No, I heard. I think I heard the first major release because it was the, the band was getting some like you know some steam, and I'm like, who's, who's Blackberry Smoke? And then I heard you guys sing and play, and I was like, man, this is like this is like right up my alley because it's 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 honest, great lyrics, great playing, great band. I mean, it's like it, it just takes me back to those days where you're just like, okay, that this is what a, this is what a band is. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Historically, I mean, it's like to, to be in a band for 20 years, it's hard, you know? A lot of our favorite bands didn't make it 20 years, you know? That's right. So how do, how do you guys maintain that, that you know, I, I know ZZ Top maintains a relationship because they, don't, they, never, they never hung out with each other. They have yeah. three separate buses and they go three separate directions <laughs> and they only meet on stage. I mean, how do you, I mean, and, you know, backstage and seeing you guys here and then you guys all get along, it's like a, it's a big, road family. It's like, how, how do you guys maintain those relationships? I really think it's because we started uh, with nothing, you know, with no help. We didn't, right. we, uh, unlike so many of our friends even who, like the Black Crows from Atlanta, for example, they put their band together and it instantly got a record deal. Right. So they were given sort of a direction pretty much immediately. And they got really successful really quickly and then they started fighting right so in our case we have never had any success <laughs> <laughs> and we never signed a play with a label a major label we wanted to keep everything in house nice and um, not owe anybody any money right um i don't know i think that simplified everything mm -hmm. so there were no like egos didn't start to get in the way. We were literally five dudes in a van eating bologna sandwiches for a decade, yeah. driving from Atlanta to Sturgis and back, you know, um, and then starting to come over here to Europe in 2008 or so, and buying our own tick plane tickets, you know. Yeah. So I don't know. I I, I don't know if that's a clear cut answer, but it seems like we've uh, everybody was so focused laser focused on keeping it going and making it work that we didn't have time to fight. Well, you know, the thing is, I, I would say, it, you know, being 35 years, I mean, it was like, you know, nobody helped Roy and I do anything. Yeah. And you know, we, we had to, you know, and, I, and, and, and people were like, well, how did you do it? You know, when you're 600 miles in between gigs and you're going, we, I can't drive as fast as I want to because we're going through too much gasoline and I don't, we don't have the money for the gasoline. You know, and I always said when your back is against a brick wall, sometimes is in, in, in sometimes as hopeless as, as it may seem at, at that time, is the best place you could ever be in life because you have no other option than to go forward. That's right. And that was always been our our our, our motto was if if nobody's inviting us, we're going to invite ourselves. If nobody wants to record me, we're going to record ourselves. If nobody's going to it's, it's we're gonna we're gonna create our own universe, and that's exactly what you guys have done. It's successful. Congratulations. We learned it from you, then. Well, no, no. Tenacity. 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 And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, there's so many stories out there that, that in the music business of, of things happening really quickly to, to to folks, and and then and then. 20 years out, they don't have a foundation to build on. They had maybe a couple hits or whatever, a, a machine behind them early on, and now they're, they're, they're struggling to even get back to where they were pre-record deal. Yeah. And, you know, it's a testament to, to, to your work at, at and, and, and how good you guys are. Well, thank you. I think we also just keep adding band members and it just makes it more and more confusing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, you know, Charlie and I, I, I don't know uh, if people are familiar with uh, um, our, my, my album, uh, Time Clocks. 
Yes. Yeah. And a little known fact, and, and for those who didn't read the fine print, Charlie Starr and I wrote this song called Notches, which we're going to play in a couple of days. And and one of the things I always admire about your band is is, is the writing. Is like, who are some of your favorite like songwriters? that maybe people, maybe not the obvious choices, but maybe people would go, hmm, I never thought Charlie Starr would be into somebody like that. Uh, well, Towns Van Zandt um, and Guy Clark, though, the Texas guys, because they, they really took country songwriting to another level, to sort of like Chris Christopherson did. He, all of a sudden it became real poetry and storytelling and not just I mean, not that there's anything wrong with Hank Senior, because those songs are gospel songs, mm -hmm. really, right. where I come from. But, um, but then, you know, not only those guys, but Brian Wilson, um, Lil George, yeah. um, Jagger and Richards. Yeah. Um, nothing against Lennon McCartney, because but I've always been more of a Stones person than a, <laughs> than a Beatles person. Yeah. But, an interesting thing, and it's not news to anybody, but Mick Jagger and Keith Richards gave credit where credit was due to Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and yeah. Jimmy Reed when none of the other guys were really. Amen. It was like, they, they championed those guys you know, for being their heroes um, and weren't selfish about it. There was a great clip of uh, uh, the Rolling Stones, and I believe it was Brian Jones. And and it was there. They were like some English like teen show, like the Beat Club or something like that. And, and the, the presenters entered, you know, interviewing Brian and in the, in the, in the Stones. And, and Brian just goes, "Why are you talking to me? You have Howlin' Wolf on stage." Let Howlin' Wolf go. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it's it it, it it is great to see. You know, because like you know, there's that great clip of Buddy Guy sitting with the Stones at the Beak and and and. and Always, you know, BB King, uh, uh, get your yayas out. Uh, I can Tina. They always champion their musical musical heroes, even though they were, in some cases, more successful professionally than than their heroes. But they would always say, "This is this is where we came from." There's a photo I saw of their backstage. I think at Madison Square Garden, and Booker White is backstage with them, and Mick and Keith Keith grabs a resonator, national steel guitar, and starts to play, and Mick starts to sing. And Booker White is not, apparently he's not really aware of how huge they are, but he goes, God, you guys are great. You should make a record. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it, it is amazing. It's like, you know, I, I feel blessed in my life um, that I got to meet just about all of my musical heroes before they had passed on. Um, um, I, I never got to meet Stevie, Stevie Ray Vaughan and and I wanted to meet Albert King, but I remember in eighth grade coming to English class and my teacher knew I was into music and he said, I just heard Albert King passed away. And I was like, like wow. devastated, you know? And, and I was the only kid in my class that was like visibly, you right. know, they would know Albert King. But, you know, we grew up in a generation where our heroes were still active, yeah. you know? And, and now, you know, you know, Buddy's still out there, he's 87, you know, there's, there's, a select few of those those original masters, you know, like Bobby Rush is still playing, you know. Yeah. Um, like, would you consider the blues or country music more of an influence on just your playing in, 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 in general? Both. Both. Well, because I grew up, my dad is a bluegrass guitar player and singer, not a lead player, just mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a songster. He mm -hmm. plays rhythm guitar and sings, and that he taught me how to well, I wanted to know how to do that because he would, at the drop of a hat, if I, he would come home from a 40 hour work week and any time I said, can we play a song? And he would, yes, we can. And he would sing Wreck of the Old 97 or Roll in My Sweet Baby's Arms or The White Dove, any of these bluegrass sort of Celtic kind of ballads, you know. But then I heard I heard Sitting on Top of the World by two people. I heard a Bill Monroe version and the Mississippi Sheik's version. And I thought, that's the same song. Mm -hmm. Sang two different ways. But it's the same lyrics and it has the same story. 
but it's got two different types of instrumentation and two different cultures singing it. Right. Somehow it all met in the middle. And I would go to this little record store in West Point, Georgia, called Nader's Music. And I got, I wanted to know about blues. And this may sound corny, but another really good entrance for, for me, I wouldn't have known who Robert Johnson was had it not been for that movie with Ralph Macchio, Crossroads, right. when I was right. a kid. And I, I was instantly fascinated with that story. So I go to Nader's Music and there was a fellow there that owned the store and he started he would give me music, a cassette. Here, take this. You'll like this. This is Mississippi Fred McDowell. Take this. And so that was my entrance into the blues. The blues. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the thing is, my my introduction to the blues was you know, through through my father. It, 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 he would play me records <coughs> in the weekends, and and I I went in, I went to London. To get to Mississippi, yeah. uh -huh. so um, I, the first time I heard "Sitting on Top of the World," Cream was playing. Yeah, you know, and I didn't know what a Howling Wolf was, yeah. and I didn't know, you know. And then I remember one day I started getting into the blues, and, and I had a calendar, a blues-themed calendar, and I still have one page of it. And BB King signed it 35 years ago, and it's him in those shorts with the, the uh -huh. ES5. <laughs> and I looked at May 8th, and I saw. Born Robert Johnson. Now, what is Robert Johnson? And then one thing led to the next, and then you realize all those songs that I was hearing the British do came from these guys almost 50 years before. And it was like that was when my, my life went from mono to stereo. <laughs> and that's, but still though, it, it, Predominantly, I'm an electric guitar player. You know, I, I own acoustics, but I'm an, I'm an electric guitar player because I went through London, you know? I like the sound of a Marshall stack in the 335. Cause I've, I've seen you play the acoustic guitar and you don't struggle. I, well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I own it. <laughs> so, but it is two I mean, as a player, it is two diff completely different disciplines, yeah. you know? I mean, you know, acoustic, you know, they don't really sustain as much as an electric, and, and so how do you how do you uh, how do you balance that? You know, because it's two hats. You're exactly right. It's two. I literally can't use the same pick playing an acoustic guitar. It's terrible. So you, I prefer a much thicker pick, or, or I'll play with my fingers. Right. It's just a different. It's a different uh, different job description. It is. I, my father always gets on me that I, I use the, these little uh, Dunlop uh, Jazz 2 or Jazz 3 or Herco things. Yeah. And I use it on the acoustic. And he goes, it sounds like shit. Use a real pick. Use a real pick. <laughs> you know why I use those things. My dad's got, uh, those bluegrass guys, they use real tortoiseshell, which I probably shouldn't talk about this in public because it's almost like conspiracy theorist kind of thing. But, but let me go and tell you a story. They come from a specific type of tortoiseshell that I guess over the decades some combs were made with that material and hairbrushes and mirrors and well they make damn good guitar picks. They're, they do. They slide off the strings like glass. Anyway, my dad is, there's always a pick. I'm going to get in trouble for this. There's always a pick guy. And then I was like, it was like having a weird drug deal with my own father. <laughs> I called and said, I need to talk to the pick guy. And he's like, okay, we're going to talk about this when you get here. <laughs> so I get there to his house for Thanksgiving, and he's got three options, different thicknesses. They're, sh they're shaped by hand. And they come from combs and stuff. My dad didn't literally go kill a tortoise, but yeah. So he goes, all right. I said, I, I like that one. He's like, all right, you take it. He goes, you know what? Leave this with me. I don't want you to get stopped on the way home to Atlanta. <laughs> and I thought, so would there be like a Georgia State trooper that would be like, what is that? Yeah. That better be celluloid, son. <laughs> Yeah, I find a great way to, 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 to source tortoiseshell shell pictures. I, I, you know, we do these cruises twice a year. I just drag a net behind the boat. And it, and I got pits for life. I'm in the 
Saratoga, man, so I gotta do something for this man. He thinks, when the lights go off and the demons come, boy, oh boy, I close my eyes and I see myself in that toga. That's some pretty heavy shit. <laughs> But it, it is a difference, and uh, you know, we're both uh, admirers of, of vintage guitars and amps and things like that. And and not to sound like cork snappers, there is a difference. There is a soul that's ingrained into these things that they've lived life before we've purchased them. You know, what, what do you think it is about um, old guitars that 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 not only bring out songs but bring out the best in in in, in players? I don't know, it's just, but it's a magical thing. And uh, there's, I have some friends that could care less. Couldn't care less, sorry. Um, not interested. Right. Guitar players mm -hmm. who would rather have a new guitar. Right. And uh, I just don't see it. There are funny little idios idiosyncrasies that you'll find pretty instantly about a guitar. And you're like, oh, I've got to play around that. Oh, that's a funny little quirk. But it, it's interesting to have it there. It's yeah. like lived in and... Some people talk about the ghosts that are in them, you know, it's the real thing. Absolutely, and, and you know, I mean, part of the...